Every once in a while, I need to leave a reminder about what all this nutrition talk is actually for. And I think if you really break it down, one of the foundations of food as a whole is energy. Calories are energy and food is fuel. Because what's the point of a good-looking and well-maintained body if you don't do anything with it? Your body is meant to move. It's like the only mechanism on Earth that actually improves with use. Not by abusing it, but by providing the proper ingredients and putting it under the proper stresses, the human body is designed to improve. Throughout this series, we've been focusing a lot on the building and maintenance nutrients, giving your body the ability to prepare for the activity yet to come and to recover from the activity that's already occurred. I think it's about time we talk about a component that has a direct impact on the activity itself, one that is somehow both the most beloved in the fitness realm and yet still very underrated. Let's get back into the true nutrients. While creatine actually fitting the definition of a nutrient is a little questionable, if you consider it to be one, it's as true as any other. Though most people think of creatine as a supplement, and we'll get there in a minute. Creatine is, I think, the first in the series that is not an essential nutrient. A significant amount of it is made in the liver, kidneys, and pancreas out of the amino acids arginine, glycine, and methionine. Granted, methionine is an essential nutrient, so I guess there is some room for debate there. Anyway, about 95% of creatine is found in muscle cells, mainly in the form of phosphocreatine, while some is in the brain, phosphocreatine being a combination of creatine and a phosphate group. For more information there, I would refer you to my phosphorus video. Anyway, phosphocreatine is in essence a stored form of energy, used to make ATP, adenosine triphosphate, your body's go-to choice for energy, especially for heavy lifting and other higher intensity exercise. As I talked about in my phosphorus video, ATP is made of a nitrogenous base, in this case adenine a ribose sugar molecule, and as the name suggests, three phosphate groups. While creatine is not directly used in the formula of ATP, it is the best way to rush more phosphorus to be used for ATP. You can almost think of it like a motor race. Your muscles are the race car, ATP is the fuel, and creatine is the pit crew. And it's a really effective pit crew. It's like Guido in cars. <laughs> The thing about ATP, though, is that it runs dry in muscles very quickly, usually after only about 10 seconds. External sources of creatine in food or supplementation has been shown to extend this window and increase the accessibility of stores in your muscles. The specifics of how creatine actually benefits your body, though, are a bit more complex. Creatine is mainly used to produce energy during higher intensity exercise, to promote strength, muscular growth, and improve exercise performance. Due to it aiding increased ATP capacity, creatine assists with muscle growth and exercise in many ways, by straight up allowing more work and volume to be performed, improving cell signaling, enabling more efficient nervous communication for muscle firing and muscle repair, increased intracellular hydration, making sure muscles have enough water for proper function and growth. As cells naturally usher in some water with creatine, improving endurance as well as explosive power, power being strength or work relative to speed, perceived raising of anabolic hormones including IGF-1, insulin-like growth factor, and perceived lower levels of myostatin, a protein that limits muscle growth. Creatine is undoubtedly regarded as the single most effective supplement for building muscle mass. In fact, some studies show creatine supplementation increases strength and muscle mass even without resistance training, but you should still probably be doing it anyways. Supplementing creatine can also increase phosphocreatine in the brain, which is shown to improve its health and function as well, notably short-term memory. Creatine supplementation is also believed to help prevent neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, and to help treat epilepsy and brain injuries caused by traumatic events. Admittedly, many of these studies were performed on animals, but of the human studies, those on more plant-based diets seem to benefit the most. I can assume because they don't get as much organically from their diet. Higher creatine intake is also shown to lower blood pressure levels, reduce heart-related disease risk, and treat fatty liver disease, and probably a lot more. This seems to just be one of those things that can do no wrong. So how much creatine is actually needed to see these effects? Well, the human body naturally produces 1 to 2 grams per day when amino acid needs are met. If it didn't, then you would have very limited access to your phosphagen energy system. And on top of that, the average person on an omnivorous diet is consuming 1 to 2 grams of creatine in food as well. When it comes to supplementation, though, the recommended maintenance amount is 3 to 5 grams per day of creatine monohydrate, easily the most common version that I'll talk about here in a minute. This is a border 
borderline negligible amount that you could easily add to any drink. For example, if you take a pre-workout or have a post-workout protein shake, but you could also just as easily add it to a glass of water. And for the most part, that's about it. Creatine is about as straightforward as it gets. The only exception being that some trainers and others in the athletic world recommend what's called a creatine loading phase, where you take a larger amount for a short period of time to saturate the muscles. The intention behind creatine loading is to increase muscle store capacity quicker, but it will eventually happen regardless if you're consistent with a maintenance dose. The typical recommendation for the loading phase is 20 grams spread throughout the day in four 5-gram doses, but according to the ISSN, the International Society for Sports Nutrition, the true recommended loading dose is your body weight in kilograms multiplied by 0.3, and this loading phase shouldn't go longer than seven days before switching to the maintenance dose of three to five grams, because once your stores are full, your body just gets rid of the excess. And last up for today, let's talk about sources of creatine. Creatine is naturally found in foods, so theoretically you can get quite a bit even without supplementation. The point that I must emphasize is plants do not contain creatine, at least not to my knowledge. Creatine is an animal-exclusive nutrient like vitamin B12, it just straight up does not naturally exist in the plant realm. Obviously, plants can contain the amino acids necessary for your body to produce it, but if we're just talking about direct creatine sources, this is now a meat video. Red meat tends to be the go-to source, containing somewhere between 250 and 500 milligrams per 100 grams. Red meat including all of beef, pork, goat, lamb, bison, venison, and so on. For poultry meat, chicken breast averages between 200 and 220 milligrams per 100 grams, and chicken thigh contains around 250 milligrams per 100 grams, while other poultry meats like turkey and duck are not far off. The real stars of the creatine show, though, are fish. Herring consistently has the most of all fish at between 650 and 1,000 milligrams per 100 grams. Wild-caught salmon has an impressive 500 milligrams in the same amount, followed by tuna at 450, sardines at 400, and cod at 350. If you're wondering about creatine beyond meat, cheeses also contain some, the highest being parmesan, pushing 3 grams per 100 grams. Now, this may seem like a lot until you remember how much more calorically dense cheese is than meat and fish. Beyond that, dairy is less impressive, with an 8-ounce glass of milk containing about 50 milligrams. Also, eggs, for once, are not really a relevant source of the nutrient of the day, so it's definitely possible to consume a significant amount of creatine in a reasonable diet. That being said, if if you want to reap the full benefits of creatine, supplementation is very strongly advised, if not pretty much necessary. Creatine might just be the single most well-regarded supplement on Earth. As of right now, creatine has no consistent negative effects for those who take recommended doses. The only possible exception may be in those with pre-existing liver or kidney issues, and even that is still not for sure. Easily the most common form of creatine supplementation is creatine monohydrate, made of a creatine molecule and a water molecule. It is pretty affordable and extremely well-backed. All other types are far less directly researched, but they are generally shown to be safe and effective as well. The variants worth mentioning include creatine hydrochloride, which is creatine chemically combined with hydrochloric acid. It has recently garnered more hype due to its increased solubility in water, the one consistent advantage being that it requires a smaller dose. But there's not really any proof it's superior in any way to monohydrate in recommended doses. The next is buffered creatine, which is creatine with an added alkaline powder. This is supposed to increase potency, but in practice there is a negligible consistent difference. Another is creatine ethyl ester, which is claimed to be better absorbed than monohydrate, though the actual proof of this is inconsistent at best. And the last is creatine magnesium chelate, which is creatine bonded with magnesium, and this is generally found to have a negligible difference compared to monohydrate as well. Basically, I and any professional will tell you that there's no real reason not to at least start with creatine monohydrate. It is the cheapest and most backed, and it's just as effective as any other variation. They're all going to function largely the same, you're still getting a significant ATP boost at the end of the day. It's just a matter of what's the best way to obtain it and get it into your body. Now, if you're in the smaller population that tends to get stomach or gut discomfort or an excessive need to pee from monohydrate, then maybe branch out to see if your body reacts better to something like hydrochloride or a buffered variant. I know a lot of y'all have been waiting to hear me say this, so here goes. Creatine monohydrate is one of the very few supplements that I would actively recommend to pretty much anyone. 
Now, this does not open the floodgates of me talking about supplementation. If anything, I think my stinginess with the topic just goes to show how above and beyond creatine actually performs. Much like omega-3s, it is a nutrient first and only a supplement due to the difficulty of obtaining it in a normal diet. Its effectiveness, affordability, and general safety is what makes creatine a one-of-a-kind boost to nearly every aspect of your health and fitness. And if you take either of those things seriously, this is one that should be on your radar. Now, if you enjoyed the video, or at the very least learned a little something, I encourage you to subscribe as I have plenty more of these on the way. Go ahead and let me know down in the comments what other nutrients you think deserve an entire in-depth breakdown video like this. And remember that all I ask is that you do your own research and advocate for your body. You only get the one.